Hi, I'm Randy O'Brien, and we want to welcome you to the services of Calvary Road Baptist Church, an independent fundamental Baptist church located at 3795 St. Joseph Road in New Albany, Indiana. We'd love to have you visit one of our many services throughout the week. On Sunday morning, our Sunday school classes meet at 10 o'clock with our worship service at 11. Our Sunday night service is at 6, and our Wednesday evening Bible study is at 6.30. At our Wednesday night service, we have several ministries going on at the same time. Our teen department meets with our youth pastor, Brother Bob Scholes, to receive a challenge from God's Word, as well as some game time and fellowship. Our King's Kids ministry also meets at this time. This is a ministry geared for children between 1st and 6th grade. Brother Troy Edwards, our King's Kids director, does a great job teaching Scripture as well as helping our kids to hide God's Word in their heart through Scripture and memory and song. While these ministries focus on our young people, our adult Bible study has been studying verse by verse through the book of Acts, followed by a time of prayer for the needs of our congregation as well as the needs of others. Calvary Road Baptist Church has many ministries available to serve you and your family. We have conferences, retreats, and camps available for men, women, couples, and young people. We have a Christian school for students from first through 12th grade, a great teen department, and junior church. We have opportunities for you to serve, whether in our choir, our homeless outreach ministry, bus ministry, nursery, ladies ministry, audio video, and much more. You can find videos of our services at our website, www.calvaryroadbaptist.net. You can listen to our services every Sunday morning at 7 on the radio on 1570 AM and on television at 8 on WNDA Indiana 9. For Time Warner subscribers, that's Channel 98. Once again, we'd like to welcome you to our services, and we'll now join last week's service already in progress. There's a song I started singing as a child in Sunday school. It made me feel so good to sing it. I loved it then, and I still do. The sweetest song this side of heaven Sung by children young and old The sweetest song this side of heaven If Jesus loves me, this I know The melody is very simple and the words, they're simple too. But what makes this song so special is just knowing that it's all so true. The sweetest song this side of heaven, sung by children young and old. The sweetest song this side of heaven. Jesus loves me, this I know. The sweetest song, this side of heaven. If Jesus loves me, this I know. It all starts with just one voice that takes a stand, that makes a choice to live for God and not hesitate to tell the world about amazing grace. One day that seed somehow breaks through where there was one, there and now stands two, and soon another takes his hand, a ray of hope that spreads across the land, across the mountains, across the sea. Soon others join in harmony. Strong, and soon a mighty chorus sings along. Go reach the world, touch one more soul, bring one more lamb back to the fold. Each soul another flag unfurled. 
each voice another chance to reach the world. Don't let me pray, Lord, for wealth or fame, a spark that sets the world aflame. But help me reach the lost and alone to tell of joy and hope where hope is gone. Go reach the world, touch one more soul, bring one more lamb back to the fold. Each soul another flag unfurled, each voice another chance to reach the world. Each voice another chance to reach the world. Is there something in your way? A battle you can't win? Do you struggle day to day with thoughts of giving in? There's no reason for despair. He has walked this way before with compassion flowing free. He's there for you and me. That's what grace is for. When all hope fades away and prayers are only words, just reach out in faith and know He's already heard. He'll mend your wounded heart. And peace he will restore. His arms are open wide. Walk through mercy's door. That's what grace is for. When the answer just won't come And your soul cannot be still When it's all been said and done Rest in the Father's will There's a multitude of sins Covered by the blood that pours, blood that cleanses every stain, so that none remain. That's what grace is for. When all hope fades away and prayers are only words, just reach out in faith and know he's already heard. He'll mend your wounded heart and peace he will restore. His arms are open wide walk through mercy's door that's what grace is for his arms are open wide walk through mercy's door that's what grace is for Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, 
There my burning soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did spend at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. There are some things I may not know. There are some places I can't go. But I am sure of this one thing. That God is real, for I can feel him deep within. My God is real, he's real in my soul. My God is real, for he has washed and made me whole. And his love for me is like pure gold. My God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. Some folks may doubt, some folks may scorn, all can desert and leave me alone. But as for me, I'll take God's part, for God is real and I can feel him in my heart. My God is real, he's real in my soul. My God is real, for he has washed and made me whole. And his love for me is like pure gold. My God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. I cannot tell just how you felt when Jesus took your sins away. But since that day, yes, since that hour, my God is real, for I can feel his holy power. My God is real, he's real in my soul. My God is real, for he has washed and made me whole. And his love for me is like pure gold. My God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. Yes, my God is real, he's real in my soul. My God is real, for he has washed and made me whole. And his love for me is like pure gold. My God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. It was the third day.
preachers say but God still has a few good men who won't bend won't bow won't burn they will fight to the end to defend our faith until the day that the whole world learns there are things we won't give over there are things worth fighting for the book and the blood and the rugged cross one faith one way one Lord when the world and the flesh and the devil press on and try to tear our strongholds down, we will stand our ground. Amen. Despite what the non-believers say, our God has never changed. His word, still, his word still means everything it says. It is now and forever the same. The world may think they have won this fight, but there are some that can still be found who will never give in and will never give up. We will stand our ground. There are things we won't give over. There are things worth fighting for. The book and the blood and the rugged cross, one faith, one way, one Lord. When the world and the flesh and the devil press on and try and tear our strongholds down, we will stand our ground. When the world and the flesh and the devil press on and try and tear our strongholds down, we will stand our ground. 
John chapter number 6, verse 66, down through verse number 69, the Bible says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this truth this morning, that there is nothing in this world, nothing that has ever existed in this world, that is worth us turning away from you. Because there is nothing in this world that is of any eternal value beyond you. There is nothing worth us giving our life for, and not even something worth giving our ear to, to listen to, that contradicts the Word of God. Because Lord, You are the truth. And Lord, You are the one who has the words of eternal life. And so Lord, today I pray that we would recognize that You, You alone, are our only hope. Not just for our, our nation, not just for our state, but for our church, and for our homes, and for our individual lives. And that we would look to you and you alone, for you are sufficient. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Yes, in a few days, our country is going to be making a choice about who will serve as our next president. I didn't mention this earlier, I wanted to, and I, I skipped over it by accident, but Tuesday uh, we will have the building open, and so if you would like to come, and if you are able to get like, you know, half hour off for work or whatever to go vote, and you've got time to come by before or maybe after, uh, you might want to come after because your line might be kind of long on Tuesday, uh, but if you wanted to come by and just spend some time in prayer, uh, this altar will be open then all day long, and you come and uh, just spend some time. We're not going to have an official time of a prayer meeting. Uh, it's not for that purpose, it's just for us to take some time maybe in, in the building, uh, no phones going off, no TVs, nothing like that, to just be undistracted while we pray for our nation, and our nation needs prayer regardless of the results on Tuesday. I do not look forward to what's going to happen in our country either way this week. Um, there is a division in our country that is unhealthy. Um, there is a division in our country that is like dynamite ready to go off. And I'm not looking forward to what's going to happen. But I will say that you ought to vote. If you're a Christian, God has given us a great opportunity to have part. I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but you ought to vote. And you ought to vote, uh, and you ought to know who you're voting for. And you ought to not make a choice just because of uh, well, somebody else told me I should vote for this person. Uh, you should get, go online and download the ballot for whichever county you're in and look over each one of those things uh, and look over the measures. We've got measures about hunting and fishing. All those things are important to some regard, and so you ought to know what you're heading in there to vote for, study that out, uh, and vote for those things uh, because God has given us that freedom for however much longer we have it, we ought to use it. So I want to encourage you to vote, but whether or not the person you want to win wins this week, they're going to sit in the White House for the next four years, and there are some things that are going to change, but there are some things that aren't going to change as well. The Bible will still be just as powerful and true four years from now as it is today. I was told eight years ago on election day that probably by 2016 I would no longer have the freedom to preach God's Word. Can I just tell you something? My freedom to preach God's Word does not come from the White House. It comes from God. Now, I'm glad I get to preach it here as opposed to a prison ministry, but as long as I have breath, my call to preach has not come because of a license or an opportunity from my government, and it will not end until He takes that last breath from me. It will not change that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It will not change that the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one, and that the wages of sin is death. 
It will not change that it says that God has commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It will not change the truth of the fact that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It will not change that with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We normally refer to those statements as part of the Romans road. They're taken from Paul's epistle to the believers in Rome and they point out very distinctly what is wrong with all mankind. This last year I have sat many times in front of my television or reading a newspaper or an article online and thought, what is wrong with our country? That's what's wrong with our country. It's got a bunch of people in it and we're all sinners. And unfortunately, we keep following the flesh. These verses point out very distinctly what is wrong with all of mankind. What will happen if, happen if nothing is done and what the remedy for man's need really is. You see, man is a sinner. He is inherently not good. That is who we are. And our sin will result in eternal death and we will be separated from God in a place called hell forever. That was what we were condemned already to. Yet God loved us. And Jesus Christ was willing to come to earth and put on a robe of flesh and live in this life, a sinless life, born of a virgin, never knowing sin, yet He became sin for us. And eternal life can be yours if you turn to Christ for salvation. The saddest truth, though, is there are many people today that would be more excited if their football team won yesterday than for a lost sinner coming to know Christ. I got wrapped up in the game the other night. I, I'm not a Cubs fan, but man, I enjoyed watching the Cubs win the other night. I, I was, they were always kind of like my second team as a kid because nobody else was on TV. And so I could watch the Cubs all the time as a kid when I lived at my grandma's house. And I watched them, and I, I got wrapped up in that game. I enjoyed that. Five million people show up to a parade. That's, a, that's an amazing feat if you think about it. Five million people. And I'm not saying don't enjoy sports. I'm not saying don't be happy or upset at the outcome Tuesday. But it's sad the things that will affect this life are more exciting or depressing to us than things that impact eternal life. And we're no longer excited about the things of God. The only hope for America is Jesus Christ. The hope of America is not found in a politician. It never has been. And as Christians, we've not always done the best of displaying that. We've said it. We've had a consistent message. We've said the hope of America is not in the White House, but then we live life as if the White House is make or break for us as Christians. The only hope for this world is Jesus Christ. Where do we need to be looking to for answers? We need to look no further than Him and His Word, our personal hope in Jesus Christ. And since He's the only hope that we have, how shall we live? How shall we speak? Who should we fear? What should we be doing? You see, He is the only hope for the world. He's the only hope for America. He's the only hope for Indiana. He's the only hope for Calvary Road Baptist Church. And He's your only hope as well. And so in light of those truths, I want to challenge us this morning concerning our relationship with Jesus Christ. I've had 26 emails this week encouraging me on what to preach this morning. Not from any of you. You may have thought of sending those. I may not have gotten those. I don't know. But I've had all kinds of encouragement on what I should tell you this morning. I ignored every one of them <laughs> because I feel like God would have us to not focus on that, but to focus on Jesus Christ. 
First, I would say, how can we live concerning our relationship with Jesus Christ today in light of understanding that He is our only hope? First of all, love Him supremely. Love Him supremely. He loves us supremely. His love for us is eternal. He cannot and will not stop His love for us. And He longs to express that love for us. At verse 67 there in our text, Jesus said to them, Will ye also go away? It isn't that Jesus didn't know what they were going to do. He was making them aware of what they were going to do. And I believe He wanted His followers, and I believe He still wants His followers, to acknowledge Him as the object of their love. He wants us to not just, well, I know down in my heart. He wants us to acknowledge with our mouth what our intentions are with Him. In John chapter 21, Jesus pins Peter down and kind of verbally forces him to express his love for him. He says, who saith unto him the third time? He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved, it says, because he said to him a third time, lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. He's saying, Lord, you already know the answer. But he said, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. So Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. See, the expression was supposed to then lead to an obedience. The question today is not, it should not be, and I hope it's not for you, I hope you understand that God loves you supremely. The question for you today is, Do you love Him supremely? Do you love Him supremely? Look over, hold your place here in John chapter 6. And let's go over to John chapter 14. Here's a good test for you. Do you love God supremely? Verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. We don't desire to keep His commandments. We desire to revel in His liberty. I can do what I want because He loves me. But He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Don't say, I can do whatever I want because He loves me. Say, because I love Him, I'm going to obey His commandments. Our love is measured in direct proportion to how we keep His commandments. We are to prove our love through obedience. So all too often we say do you, to someone, do you love me? And we understand in the human realm that someone who just says, I love you, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. That actions will show if they really love us. Well, the same is true spiritually when talking to the Lord. We know He loved us. He showed us how He loved us. He sent His Son to die for us. That's not a debate. The question is, do you love Him? And our love for Him must supersede all of our other affections and love and connections in this world. Nothing else is to be important in comparison to our love for Him. Jesus said unto him over in Matthew chapter 22, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. So do you love Him? And are you showing your love? The best way is through our actions. Talk, talk is cheap. Many times it's meaningless. So, love Him supremely. Secondly, in light of your relationship with Jesus Christ, labor for Him consistently. The work of God is many times referred to as labor and needing laborers. She says, therefore I said unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, harvest and that He would send forth laborers into His harvest. Understand, the harvest is ready. We don't have to wait until that time. People will say something like, well, you know, they're going to take away our freedom to share the gospel. Most of, you, most of our Christians have handed that over a long time ago. Why are we worried about losing a right we don't use anyway? Well, they're going to take away our right for this and take away our right for that. Well, let's exercise that right. And maybe we wouldn't have that problem so much. Because you know what? We have no guarantee of tomorrow. Somebody posted online the other day, said all this 
they, they, they were just sick of everything on, online and social media with the election cycle. And uh, they said, you know, how, as, as, as much as my blood pressure gets going, you know, I get mad at somebody posted this or posted that. He said, I'm going to feel real foolish if the Lord comes back on Monday. Because, man, I wasted a lot of time getting my blood pressure up over all this stuff going on in the world. And then the Lord comes back on Tuesday. He said, that would kind of be just a great joke on his part to us. We got all worked up. And while I spent many times and many hours trying to share this story and that story and, you know, make a meme with this or whatever, and I did all that, people are dying and going to hell all around us. We have no guarantee of tomorrow. We have a guarantee of eternity. And so that person that you're arguing with online that just won't see your point and just doesn't understand where, how they need to see things, if they die tomorrow, it won't matter which political party they were part of. They need the gospel. There are those within reach of our ministry that if we do not reach them today, tomorrow they will be in hell. There are people within the reach of this church. There are people within the reach of your life that if you don't reach them with the gospel this week, it may be too late. The harvest is wide already. Some don't like to labor because they're worried about the outcomes. The hazards may be kind of tough. In Luke chapter 10, he said, Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as labor or as lambs among wolves. So we're like, that's not exactly a recruiting pitch to come work for you. Don't worry, I'm going to send you. Oh, don't worry, I'm going to send you forth as, as like, it'll be, it'll be a good job. It'll be like your lambs and their wolves. It'll turn out okay. Um, I think I'll sign up for another job is how many would think. The problem is, it's not the lamb's job to protect themselves from the wolves. It's their job to be lambs and follow the shepherd and let the shepherd take care of the wolves. But we're too busy thinking we've got to take care of all the wolves instead of just being the sheep for him and letting him take care of those battles for us. We don't need to speculate about what happened, what might happen to lambs among the wolves. They're consumed and they're destroyed when there's no shepherd to protect them. And I'm concerned about the attitude among many of God's workers today. There are a lot of people who take the approach that they will serve the Lord, they will obey the Lord, as long as it doesn't interfere with their life. If they're attacked... If they're hurt, if there's a challenge, they quit. If the road is too rocky, if it's too rough, they give up. If there's a cost, they don't want to pay it. I heard the story once of a night out on, a, on, a, on the waters, and it was dark and stormy. Uh, it, it was, you know, a rescue ship was summoned to go to a ship that was in disaster, and one of the crew members said to the captain, Sir, if we go out to that rescue, we won't make it back. The captain replied, We don't have to make it back. We only have to go out. That's the attitude that we have to go forward in with the work of the Lord. We don't have to worry about the results. We just have to obey and do what we're told. He said over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, thou, endure, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What a shame that we would consider it a greater honor to be a soldier in our nation and a soldier to defend the Constitution and defend our country as great as it may be to not, and we consider that greater than to be a soldier for something far greater. It's a great thing to be a soldier for our nation. I'm thankful for those that have ever taken on that responsibility. But far greater of a cause is the Word of God to be a soldier for. It requires a commitment, a dedication, an integrity to be a good soldier in our military. And the same is true to be a soldier in God's work. And Jesus encourages us to labor. Over in Matthew chapter 11, He says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And sometimes that burden, that labor, it gets so heavy 
and it just seems almost impossible to bear. And Jesus just says, bring it to me. Bring it to me. So we're to love Him supremely and we're to labor for Him so consistently. But thirdly, we're to look to Him continually. Look over in Mark chapter number 13. Down in verse number 33. Mark chapter 14, verse 33. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For son of man is as a man taken a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. We are to watch for the Lord's return. Four times in these verses we see the command, watch. Today, at well, every election cycle there's a renewed interest in prophecy. Well, if this person wins, God's going to decide that now the rapture is ready to happen. If that person wins, we can stave it off for another four years. I'm afraid there are too many Christians today who are looking for the Antichrist when they need to be looking for Christ. Some people would say, isn't that the same? No, it is not. We are, as Christians, to be looking for Christ. We don't need to get up into speculation of who's the Antichrist and who's going to do this and who's going to do it. We already know the outcome. We're to look for Christ. And there's a, a big difference between those who walk in fear trying to figure out who the Antichrist is so they can stop him and they can stop this and they can stop that instead of those who look at Christ and say, Our Redeemer draweth nigh. And the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. The problem is, with those who always look for the Antichrist, they keep being wrong all the time. But you won't be wrong looking for Christ. We're to be watching for Jesus Christ all the time. If we are watching for Him to come, it will make a difference then how you live. 1 John chapter 3 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath his hope in Him purifieth himself, even as He is pure. He says, if you're looking to Christ and you see Him, if you have that hope in yourself, you will purify yourself. It will affect how you live your life. So are you looking for Him? The Bible says if you are, you'll purify your life. We'll change what we do. We all make plans for the future we make plans for next week we make plans for next month we're having a planning meeting this week to plan out next year's calendar we some of us plan for our retirements we uh you know uh, but i wonder sometimes where does the coming of christ fit into our plans i'm not saying be irresponsible and uh you know give everything away to you know those people that uh, set dates on what day the lord's going to come back uh, I always wonder, do they you know, just give away all their stocks and bonds and property and everything? How, how confident are they in that faith? That, you know, I, I want to meet one of these people that sets a date one day. I'm going to ask them, like, hey, can you say then on that day, uh, like if you say November 8th, then on November, November 9th, you're donating all your property to Calvary Road Baptist Church. That'd be great. Uh, you know, but none of them ever are, are willing to seem to be uh, able to do those things. But uh, you know, I will say that if we truly have faith that He is coming, I'm not talking about giving away everything and setting dates, but I will say that it will affect how we live our life. Because if I believe that uh, regardless of whatever outcome uh, happens on Tuesday, if I believe that the Lord's return is soon upon us, then I'll recognize that there are some in my family that I may not get an opportunity to preach at their funeral. The Lord just may call us out of here before then. And even if you thought, well, we might have 10, 15 years before it happens. Even if you thought that, that doesn't mean your neighbor has 10, 15 years. Your neighbor may have 10, 15 hours. 
If we really believe that, would it not affect? We prove this when we know someone is about to die. Somebody gets the bad news from the doctor, and the doctor says, well, we think they've got about 30 hours. What do people do? People that haven't visited them and talked to them in months or even years pay money for airline tickets. They fly home from out of state. They do everything they can to go see them because they believe the end is near for that person. When we believe the end is near, it changes our plans, it changes our attitude, it changes our actions. And I've seen parents that are about to die and their kids that they haven't seen in three, four years suddenly come back and see them because they believe the end is near. But Christians say we believe the end is near, but yet we go on every day just the same. Are you doing all that you can for Him? You see, one day you're going to stand before Him and you're going to be given an, you have to give an account of how you've invested the life that He has given to you. I wonder if we'll be able to do that in any sort of confidence or with simply trembling. I don't believe anybody will ever stand before the Lord and say, I did all I could ever do. But I hope we can stand before Him and say, we've done some of what we could do. I fear there will be many that will have no fruit that they can lay before Him. To those that are without Christ, Jesus is coming. You may not understand this, but it is not a fairy tale. It is God's Word, God's promise that has just yet to be fulfilled. But it will be filled. And when He comes... At that moment, it will be too late for you to come to Him by faith. I've always been saddened by those that are unsaved that have said things like, well, if one day a bunch of Christians are all gone, I'll know the Bible's true and I'll get saved then. For one, they have no guarantee that they'll be here that day, that they'll make it to that day, that they won't die before then. Secondly, Unfortunately, there will be a bunch of people who call themselves Christians that will go on their life like nothing ever happened when true Christians are gone. There will be a lot of churches that will continue like nothing ever happened because they were not preaching the truth of God's Word to begin with. And so when Christians are removed from the scene, this world will not think of it as all the Christians are gone. I honestly believe, and I can't take you to Scripture on this, my theory on this is that when some people come up missing, and unfortunately that number, I believe, gets less and less each year that the Lord tarries out of His patience and long-suffering with us. But I believe when those people do come up missing, there will be a strong delusion that will come people and they'll believe that there was some kind of an alien invasion. And that's how some person in this world is going to be able to stand up and calm people and they're going to trust in Him to get these things fixed. We have an infatuation in our world with aliens. I believe that people will believe that. And when that day comes, they'll believe strong delusions. They already believe strong delusions. They believe they can be saved by their good works. They believe that everything just evolved from nothing. That's a pretty strong delusion already. And yet, when we're raptured out of here, they'll believe even stronger delusions. And there will be no second chance. That moment will be The final opportunity. I wish it wasn't this way, but unfortunately, you're going to have no 10-minute bell to tell you, hey, it's coming. But what we do have is God's Word that says today is the day of salvation. People say, what day? Every day. Every day that you're given an opportunity to accept Christ, if you have not done it, that's the day you need to do it. Because you have no guarantee of tomorrow. You have today. Jesus Christ is your only hope. He's the only hope for the future. He's the only hope for our country. And as much as we say that, I'm afraid we do not display that. 
And I say that as one who has been guilty of that many times myself. At one glance, in October and November every four years, at our social media accounts, you know, they have this app, I've, I've referred to it before, Time Hop. It'll tell you, like, on this day, four, you know, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, you posted this. Those are kind of sad reminders during election seasons. When, you, when I look back and I read things that, I've, that I may have said eight years ago, wasn't a real confidence booster as, as someone who proclaims that they have faith in God. This doom and gloom attitude that even I've displayed at these times. We need to look in the mirror of God's Word and say our confidence and our hope is not here. And if I say that, why are all of my decisions seemingly based upon what the consequences in this life will be? Instead of, what decision can I make that will bring the most honor, and the most glory to the Lord Jesus Christ? We live in a nation that murders babies by the millions. We live in a nation that gives money to those who would hurt Israel. We live in a nation that defies God's word with decisions at our Supreme Court. We live in a nation where those who proclaim to be Christian preach that there are other ways to salvation besides Christ, through water baptism or through our works. We have so perverted what we are supposed to be doing that unfortunately our children have this jumbled idea of what the Christian life is supposed to be. In talking to young people, some of them get the impression that the Christians of America are nothing more than a political action committee. That we care more about the events that we read about online than the events we read in God's Word. And maybe, just maybe, it's because we spend a lot more time reading the events online than we've read from God's Word. Maybe, just maybe. We will believe in our country today anything that comes from something that looks like a news website. I'm going to pick on Brother Jason for a minute. He already knows what, I'm going to, what story I'm going to tell. He came to me a few weeks ago, and he said, Pastor, did you see this story? Somebody post, that, Did they post it on Facebook, or did they send it to you directly? Okay, so it's on Facebook. I know, it's on Facebook. It had to be true, right? He said, Pastor, you've got to see this story. This is great. And it's, I, I look at the headline, Tim Tebow. You know, he's, been, he's playing baseball now. Tim Tebow, hit by a pitch, charges the mound, and immediately forgives the pitcher to offer his forgiveness to the pitcher. And I said, pretty sure that's not right. So I looked at it. It was from a website called the, the Babylon Bee. Those of you that know the Babylon Bee, it's a satire website. I tease him because the next day they had an article that said, Tim Tebow called out on strikes looking, immediately turns around and heals the umpire of blindness. That was the next article. <laughs> Maybe he would have caught it quicker if he'd have seen that one. But we read an article, and we're all guilty of this. I could probably go around the room, and almost all of you that have Facebook, I could go down your timeline, and I could find a story that you posted that is actually not true, or a meme that gives a quote to somebody that's not what they actually said. It's like, you know, the, don't believe everything you've read on the internet, Abe Lincoln. You know, you, you've posted some kind of quote like that online. Because, hey, it was online. I saw it. I have confidence in that. God's Word, I don't know. I don't know if that really applies to today. Maybe I shouldn't quote that one. And I say this as one who's been guilty, but can I just say... Our hypocrisy is showing. And many of the things that we say and do today, the lost world is going to use against us in the very near future. They're going to use it against us. Love Him supremely. Labor for Him consistently. 
and look for Him continually. What about you this morning? Do you love Him? Are you busy, faithfully laboring for Him? Are you consistently looking and continually looking for His return? Maybe you're here and you're not saved. And I look around the room and most of you, I recognize your faces. You've at least been here before. Maybe you're not saved. I don't know your heart. But if you're here, I believe you've probably at least heard the gospel many times. I know that was not the focus of our message today, strictly on the gospel. But if you're here and you'd say, you know what? I don't know if I died today that I would go to heaven. Today's the day to take care of that. Today's the day that you, recognizing you're a sinner, look to the one who knew no sin, who died on the cross for you. And you can ask him to forgive you of your sin and save you, believing that he is Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that he is risen from the dead. And if you'll call upon him, you shall be saved. Not you might be saved, and not that's the start of your salvation, but you shall be saved. But Christian, if you're saved, you know he loves you. Do you love him? Are you serving him? Are you looking for him? Are you looking at this world? As I said earlier, you're looking for the Antichrist, trying to figure out the prophecies instead of looking to the one who is the fulfillment of all those prophecies. You see, everything that's going to come in the future is not coming because of this or become, uh, because it's coming because it's going to ultimately, ultimately bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, His honor, His glory is the culmination of those prophecies. Don't look to the individual prophecy. Look to the culmination of those prophecies. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust Him before it's too late. Let's stand this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I started out with the made up mind to one day cross the finish line pressing toward the mark and for the prize. Sometimes I've had to stand my ground cause Satan tries to turn me around but I will not be hindered by his lies. I'm not gonna walk away, I've got too much at stake and I've come too far to turn back now. Every battle that I have fought will soon be forgotten. I'm trading this old cross in for a crown. Well, I can almost hear them cheer me on and see the ones that have reached home as they await for us to win the race. A banquet like we've never known will be held at God's royal throne and there will be rewarded for our faith. I'm not, I'm not gonna walk away. I've got, I've got too much at stake. And I've, come, I've come too far to turn back now. Every battle that I have fought will soon be forgotten. I'm trading this old cross in for a crown. And I'm trading this old cross in for a crown.